Perfect. Excellent. Welcome everybody on a uh, grey Sunday morning out my window. I hope it's better out some other windows than it is out of here. So today we are talking about folklore and rural craft. Not, not an obviously gothic theme in the same way that some of the other romancing gothic gothic themes have been. Um, but I gave Sam a choice. Do you want this talk, which is very gothic, or do you want this talk, which is not quite as gothic, but a bit kind of now and again? And, and Sam chose this one, so here we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about different aspects of folklore relating to lots of different rural crafts that were obviously very significant in, in earlier days and, and still are in many ways today. So I want to start by getting everybody to think for a moment about food. Okay, always a good way to start the day. Take a moment to consider some of the food that you can buy now. So for example, I can buy a loaf of bread for around 50p. That's basic white bread, probably sliced for my convenience. If I fancy a drink, then I can get a bottle or a can of beer or something like that pretty cheaply as well. For less than a pound, I could buy a crunchy, some relatively palatable milk chocolate shoved around a bit of honeycomb. But of course, I could choose to pay a lot more than that. I could have a hand kneaded rosemary and onion for capture. Or a craft beer as well. Or a bag of fresh honeycomb pieces instead of a crunchy. But I'd pay a lot more for those. Because they're made or they're brewed by hand. They've been carefully quality controlled to choose the best ingredients. They are what we now like to call artisan products. And because of that, they come at a price. So time's reversed things, hasn't it? These are all staples in many ways. Bread used to be made or obtained fresh every day to keep a family alive. Beer was drunk when even water wasn't safe to drink. They're low cost items. And when they weren't being purchased from a provider, they were being made at home and frequently too. Rural crafts, those associated with food and drink and those which provided other day-to-day -day essentials, they were all a central part of family life and village life. What we now class as artisan was in less affluent times, the lifeblood of a community. The importance of these crafts naturally means that they become culturally very significant. That in turn means that we find a lot of folklore and superstition becoming associated with them because of that significance. And this happens in a couple of notable ways. When a craft such as baking, for example, is so important, it naturally builds superstitious beliefs because the problems which follow if it doesn't go well can be dire. So therefore we find charms and practices to ensure that things work out as we want them to, possibly coming about because of associations which are made when something is observed to not succeed. The second common aspect which is found is one which begins to be associated with a craft more when that craft sits in the hands of a practitioner or an expert. This person develops or shows natural skills in that craft, which are far in excess of other people within their community. So, for example, old Bill down the lane can fashion a crude shovel out of a piece of flat metal. Tom the blacksmith can make a fine spade with an intricate design on the handle. Bill could never do that. So why can Tom? Well, they do say that he made a deal with the devil in order to get these skills. These stories might come about through disbelief in a great talent or jealousy 
or in many other ways. But there are usually supernatural elements grafted onto a particularly skillful pr profession or the building in which one takes place. So what I'd like to do is have a look at some of these rural crafts and consider them in different ways. So how did they develop historically? How did they develop culturally? And what superstitions arose around them? And furthermore, do any of them still carry forward now into the present day? Now, as Sam said, um, this talk's based around my uh, latest book just about this one, Telling the Bees and Other Customs, The Folklore of Rural Craft. I say just about because I've got a new book which I've co-written with my wife Tracy which comes out in September looking at dark folklore, very gothic, more gothic than this, but we'll come to that later in the year. Um, I have not given this talk very often because it's based on a book which came out during lockdown one last month. OK, so there was no book launch. There was none of that kind of stuff. It's, everything has been online, but I chose not to support it with, with talks particularly um, until this stage. So I think I've, I've given this talk once before to a very small group, but otherwise you, you've got it, really. Um, so there isn't going to be time to cover all of the crafts and not in all of the detail which the book goes into, of course. So, so if you haven't got a copy, you can, and you can get it off the Folklore Podcast website. But there you go. I'm not here to sell it particularly. So we'll start with food uh, and the daily bread, if you like, which every family needed to have. So out of all of the methods of cooking, baking is probably the oldest. And most of the products which we, which are associated with it have grain as a base, not all, but most. As far back as prehistoric times, we can find evidence of the transition from eating seeds to roasting seeds, and then to combining those with water to form a mixture which could be placed onto a hot stone and cooked. And this, of course, made a form of flatbread which is precisely what this picture is. This is flatbread viewed very close up. The loaf shape followed later on once the, in, uh, the uh, idea of the enclosed oven had been developed rather than just cooking on a hot stove. So what do we know? We know that baking was well established in early Egypt, but that it was much later when it reached places like Rome, for example. So as late as the second century AD, um, it was still a household chore in that area. Pliny the Elder noted that there were no bakeries in Rome. The profession of baker was established later in that area, and it probably came about when women in wealthier families, and there were quite a number in Rome, became bored of the tedious task of making bread and just decided it would be better to pay somebody else to do it instead if they had the means to do so. Because bread comes out of grain, it's quite difficult when we look at the folklore associated with it to separate the two things out. The metamorphosis of grain into seed and then seed into loaf is cyclical in nature in the same way as the growth and harvest of grain for brewing, as you find in the legend and the well-known folk song of John Barleycorn, for example. I'll try and separate out the baked product itself in the first instance, and then we'll look at the treatment of the grain through milling to make up the main constituent part of the bread as well as a separate thing. So bread is very obviously significant in terms of religion, for example. Probably the most common association here would be, like you can see in this image, the Holy Communion. Many parts of the Christian religion can be recognised as reworkings of older celebrations. So consider the breaking of the bread story from where we get the term remembrance bread. It says in the Bible, Jesus took a loaf of bread that had been broken not and said, this loaf is symbol of my body, and the bread is symbol of the bread of life. 
And as I break this loaf, so shall my flesh be broken as a pattern for the sons of men. For men must freely give their bodies up in willing sacrifice for other men. And as you eat this bread, so shall you eat the bread of life and never die. And then he gave to each a piece of bread to eat. So remembrance in this quote, seen in the terms in which it's stated as in communion, do this in remembrance of me, can also be seen as remembrance of an older pre-Christian celebration. There are older rituals where the body of a god is sacrificed and then distributed between those people in attendance, for example. Bread as an offering can be found in other religious celebrations as well. Uh, Los Dias de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, is an important celebration in Mexico where families join together to honour the departed. It's a day of rejoicing, not a day of sorrow, and it's a time where the dead are said to awaken and join in the feast. The most commonly associated edible thing with this time now, obviously, is the alphanique, the sugar paste skull, which is placed on the altar as an offering. We see these far more since the Day of the Dead has become ripe for cultural appropriation in more recent years. Here's a little image of uh, the sugar paste skulls. Now, in the weeks leading up to Los Dias de los Muertos, people bake a circular bread. It's known as pan del muerto, or in English, the bread of the dead. This and the other food offerings stay on the decorated altars until the end of the celebrations, after which they're eaten. Some people believe that this food has no nutritional content for us because the spirits of the deceased have already consumed its essence during that ceremony. Another time of religious celebration where bread might appear in some parts of the world is Christmas. And Christmas is a time which is very rich in terms of food generally. Panettone, for example, has a good folk tale attached to it to explain why it's found on the table at this time of year. Now, in, in some stories, the product was created in the 1400s by a Duke's falconer and his love, Adalgisa, who was the daughter of a poor baker. The couple worked in secret at night to devise this bread, which was so popular that it saved the ailing bakery from which it originally came. A plain bread for most of the year, citron and fruits were added to it at Christmas time to form what we now know as panettone. And because of this, the baker became very wealthy, which meant that the couple could then marry. In Bulgaria, bread is really important in the time leading up to Christmas. December the 20th is the day of St Ignatius of Antioch. This is when the young year starts in Bulgaria. Because of this, we find customs on a par with New Year first footing traditions. So, for example, in Bulgaria, visitors will not be allowed into the house on this day if they haven't been invited in advance. And the reason for that is because tradition says that if the first person that enters a house, a house is wealthy or morally good, then they'll bring well-being to the home for the year ahead. So conversely, to invite, uh, so to invite in somebody unexpected, that would be to take the risk because they're not a good person or a wealthy person or, or a moral person in some way, uh, and therefore they don't bring the right attributes into the house. December the 20th is the time at which the Christmas holiday period begins in Bulgaria, and that's traditionally believed in that country that it's the day on which Mary first went into labour. That's why the holiday period begins at that time. So for that reason, we find that many ritual breads are being baked at this time. <coughs> One custom would be to use a hemp comb to cut off part of the dough from the batch that's made on that morning. And this small piece of dough would be kneaded as usual, 
but then it would be placed on one side to dry rather than being baked with the rest of the bread. And it would then be used later as a curative uh, along with honey. Also, before it was baked, the dough made on this day was used for ritually protecting the house from harm. So using two fingers, a cross sign would be rubbed onto a wooden beam in the house using the dough to form a kind of apotropaic mark. After all this, the dough was then finally baked, being used to make one loaf for each member of the household, plus another loaf to use on Christmas Eve. Now, speaking of Christmas Eve, we might note that in some places it's believed that bread baked on that day will never go mouldy. Other days, however, are less favourable. You shouldn't, for example, bake bread on All Saints Night, because this is a time, as we know, when the veil between the worlds is particularly thin. If you did make bread at this time, then the ghosts would simply eat it. You compare this with the Day of the Dead celebrations, where spirits eating the bread is considered to be a good thing. It's completely converse in different cultures. Superstition also highlights Good Friday as another date associated with baking bread. Now, one problem with superstitions in folklore, in fact, one problem with many other parts of folklore as well, is that they're often contradictory depending on where the folklore comes from. And that's certainly the case with this time of year. So one superstition says that it's impossible to make bread on Good Friday because any water that's used in the making of the dough will turn to blood at the time of Christ's crucifixion. But other people say that it is Good Friday rather than Christmas Eve on which baked bread won't go mouldy. In many countries, bread baked on Good Friday and kept until the following year is considered to be a good treatment for stomach complaints. You don't, you don't eat the bread, just so I can see Ulrika reacting to that. You don't eat the bread, that would be quite tricky. You, put, you grate it into a glass of water and then you drink the water. In Norway, Sweden and Germany, it's bad luck if a piece of bread is thrown onto the floor. This is also the case in Estonia. Any bread which is dropped would be picked up and kissed as a mark of respect. In France, it was bad luck to put a loaf of bread on the table upside down. In other places, it was said to bring ill fortune if you laid the bread on its side. It's bad luck to take the last piece of bread from a plate, unless you're a bachelor. In that case, it's a good thing because it gives you a better chance of marrying a rich woman. It's also said to be good luck to carry a crust of bread in your pocket. I hope you're making notes. Maybe this is connected with the leaving of offerings for the fairy folk because pockets are also connected to them, needing to be turned inside out to avoid being pixie led, for example. Bread is sometimes used as a portent of death as well as just bad luck. In some parts of Appalachia, this is the case when you first cut into a new loaf, if you slice through a hole in the that's been made in the baking process. In Yorkshire, if bread failed to rise, it was said to be a sign that there was an undiscovered corpse nearby. In Macedonia, we find a few examples. It's a sign of death if the baker forgets to add salt to the bread mixture or if the water escapes from the dough when it's being mixed. There's an example of a hole, which you don't want to find. And this is an example of cracked bread. If there's a crack in a newly baked loaf of bread, there'll also be a death in the family. In Macedonia, liking bread is a dangerous business. Now, actually, it isn't all bad in Macedonia. It's also traditional in that country to give a loaf of bread and a bottle of wine to a new bride. She'd take them straight to the kitchen before visiting any other room of the marital home with a loaf of bread under each arm. Here, she would stir the ashes 
in the fire in order to discover a small wheat cake which would have been previously placed there by her mother-in-law. And this would all ensure that she had the skills to make good bread in the future and presumably to reduce the risk of all the death portents from the baking issues from the other parts of Macedonia. I think the worst luck with bread is probably found in Portugal. In Portugal, tradition says that you should never put bread which has just been taken from the oven up to your nose to smell it. If you do, after you've died and you've been buried, the worms will only eat your nose. I assume this is a use of folklore as a warning to people not to do something stupid, i.e. don't put bread that's just come out of the oven on your face to smell it. That's all I can think of. In the very early days of baking in Egypt, Everything would have needed to have been done by individuals, which means that grain would have needed to be milled yourself. This was done by hand using two quern stones. One of them was fixed, <coughs> excuse me, and then the second one on top was mobile. The fixed one is more properly called the quern. Uh, the top one rotating on top of it is the hand stone. Grain went in through a hole in the centre, which was known as a hopper. And so we can see that this is kind of a precursor to that part of the machinery in a mill. And, and I'll come on to that in just a moment. Now, this process was certainly used very early in our history. Evidence in the British Museum leads us to suspect that the process actually took place as far back as the Neolithic. Now, if you think back to an earlier mention of John Barleycorn and harvests, it's worth noting that the constant turning of the seasons is a really important image when we look at nature, hence early nature-based religions and practices as well. Folklore is of course all about symbolism and the interpretation of the meaning of things. So one reading here might be that the movement of the quern can be seen as representing the cosmos and hence the constant turning of the seasons. In Finland and in other Scandinavian countries, in fact, we find myths which refer to the world mill, which constantly turns, giving out good and bad fortune as it does so. Milling with a hand quern was usually done by two women. In the Bible, in fact, when speaking of Judgment Day, not the Terminator film, the other one, Jesus says, two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Now, the historic development of mills comes about from these hand querns, First off with water mills, and then later with windmills around the 11th or 12th century. Or in the case of this fantastic one, a combination of two where you just slap one on top of the other. I think that's great. It's at this point that I think we start to see early evidence of the mill as a place of supernatural events. There were no millers working in mills at this time in the early period. It was more of a communal building. People took their own grain and they used the mill themselves to grind it into flour. So here, fairies begin to become associated with the buildings in the same way that helpful spirits such as brownies might be found in houses or on farms. This probably comes about because the process of grinding flour, which can be slow and arduous, now took no time at all. In fact, it could probably be done with no human intervention, or in fact, once you've put all the stuff in, no presence in the building. Put all the grain in the hopper, leave the mill to do its thing. From this, it's only natural to see how supernatural happenings broaden out. Having machinery which moved on its own, of course it didn't, it's due to the forces of nature, but it would have been a remarkable thing to see if you hadn't seen that sort of thing before. 
that's probably what led to the pro proliferation of haunted mill stories, which we see. Why have a building providing such a useful service, though, when you can exploit it for money? This is an unfortunately common way of thinking in modern times, and it was back then. And that is the reason why the miller in the early stages of the profession is seen as a crook or a villain of some kind. I'm not destroying your childhood. I'm not suggesting that Windy Miller was a crook or a villain. He did, you know, have too much cider occasionally, but that's only one episode. Now, the Miller would be looked on unfavorably because he's responsible for levying a tax for a service which used to be free until the role of the Miller was created. So therefore anything bad or dark or evil would be ascribed to the Miller in retribution for this. Now, this is a very common trope in folklore. We also see it in many stories to do with weavers. We'll see it again a little later on in regard to blacksmiths. So the mill itself already has a reputation because of the magical nature of the machinery and hence the folklore surrounding the fairies working the mill, which I've just mentioned. This supernatural association is then naturally carried across from the mill to the miller himself. And of course, when this happens, you can be pretty sure that the devil isn't going to be too far behind. Now, as we'll learn later with the example of the blacksmith, people who possess special skills are often accused of having made a deal with the devil in order to get them. But this isn't generally the case with millers. After all, the mill is the thing that does all the work. In the case of the miller, it's increasing wealth, which is usually associated with a satanic pact. Now, there are a few cases of these sorts of stories. One less well-known folk tale in this area is one called The Girl Without Hands. It's probably less well known because of the content, which would make it far less repeated. And it goes something like this. A miller who's living in poverty meets the devil and the devil is disguised as a man. The devil promises greater wealth to the miller. And in return, he asks for what is behind the miller's shed. The miller agrees to this because he believes that it's the apple tree behind the shed that the man wants. It is, however, the miller's daughter who is behind the shed, and that's who the devil has his eye on. The miller's daughter is an innocent girl, however, and every time the devil comes for her, he can find no reason to take her away. After this has gone on for some time, the devil becomes very angry, and he gives the miller an ultimatum. Either he must cut off his daughter's hands, or the devil will take the miller instead exhibiting the more unpleasant side for which the character of the miller is going to become renowned, he cuts off the hands of his daughter. Many years later, the daughter, who has been made free, marries the king, and they have a son together. But the devil once again tries to interfere in order to get his prize, and orchestrates events to try and make everyone believe that the king wants his wife dead. Fortunately, the king's mother refuses to kill the girl and her son and sets them free, so nobody can find them. Seven years later, the king tracks them down. The girl's hands have miraculously grown back, and as in all good fairy tales, they all live happily ever after. Now, before we move on and take a look at the blacksmith and compare these supernatural stories with that craft, there's one more story associated with the supernatural nature of the mill, which I wanted to mention, and that's because it's very unusual. It comes from Quakertown in Pennsylvania around the year 1846, and it concerns a water mill belonging to Peter Reedman, not the one in the image. Uh, that's just an example of the kind of building it would have been. Now, I discovered this story in an old volume of a journal called Midwest Folklore, 
And I've seen it literally nowhere else, despite how curious it is. And I don't know why. The story says that Peter was frequently milling until late at night because there was so much demand from people in the area to have their grain milled. One night, Peter was so tired when he got home that he asked his son to go into the mill the following morning to open the sluice ready for the day's work. This he duly did, but shortly he arrived back home scared, relating that he couldn't get into the mill because the building had turned around during the night. Peter went to the mill and discovered that his son was speaking the truth and that the mill had indeed turned around. Being a naturally superstitious man, Peter believed that this was the work of witches. A local carpenter thought that the building could be turned back around if enough people helped. Many local farmers agreed. And the interesting thing is the article lists the names of the people involved. In total, 160 people offered to help and using ropes and levers, they turned the building back around. After which apparently it ran much better than it had before the whole thing happened. So what's going on? Is it a pure folk tale or is it a legend? It certainly sounds like one, but there are interesting points to it, which legendary stories usually don't have. The article lists a lot of names in connection with the event, and at least some of them can be found in the historical record. This isn't usually the case with a folk tale. Also, stories like this are usually born of some kind of notable natural event. Like the black dog stories at Bungie Church in Suffolk and the burn marks on the church door, for example, there's no evidence here of anything like that. There's no kind of unusual weather event being tied to the story, for example. So what's happening? Who knows? Whilst we're in Pennsylvania, finally, it was once thought by the Pennsylvania Dutch that the mill offered both a prevention and a cure for whooping cough. The afflicted child should be placed in the hopper of the mill and left there until all the grain had been ground out. Documentation for this superstition comes from the 19th century, but one elderly couple interviewed in 1962 recalled taking their own daughter to the local mill in 1930 for that very reason. Let's move on to another craft whose executor or executor was said to have supernatural power, metalworking. The powers of the blacksmith being otherworldly are ascribed far earlier in the progression of the trade than we see with the miller. We might naturally think of the Iron Age for the development of work with this metal, but pieces can be traced back far earlier than that. One of the oldest was discovered during the excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb, placed a good couple of thousand years before the Iron Age, around 3200 BCE. At this time, metal was considered to be a gift from the gods. So here is our earliest example of a supernatural element as well. Why? Why was this the case? Well, the dagger from the Egyptian tomb provides a good clue to this. X-ray spectroscopy showed that the composition of the metal in this dagger was in line with the makeup of iron meteorites. So it truly had come from the heavens. The creator god in Egypt was Tar, who the Greeks recognized as parallel with their own Hephaestus, who was blacksmith to the gods. And in the Latin, he becomes Vulcan. Both of these are often shown in art with a hammer and tongs, most certainly representative of the craft of the smith. Wayland the smith from Germanic mythological roots was certainly one who had supernatural skills. He used them to create weapons and armour which were equally as magical. There's a famous Neolithic tomb in Britain called Wayland Smithy. Many people naturally link the two together, but we need to be wary of making leaps of faith just because the names are similar. And this is one example. 
The name of Wayland is in fact first linked to the Barrow in a Saxon charter of 955 AD. Here is Wayland Smithy. And here in uh, recent times, we find that people have taken to leaving coins in the cracks in the stones as a form of offering. And this might stem from an old blacksmith's superstition that you should place a coin on the floor if you're borrowing the tools or fire from another smith. It was deemed to not be honourable to do this without making a payment, but conversely, it was also polite to refuse a payment. So putting a coin on the floor got around the problem from both sides. Now, modern coin assemblages are problematic because of the potential harm that can be done to the ancient stones by forcing coins into the cracks. So in the case of Wayland and Smithy, the coins are regularly removed and then donated to charity. The ritualistic hammering of coins into tree trunks, like in the photo that I have put on screen here, known as coin trees, is really similarly not to be encouraged for similar reasons. Returning to the idea of making a pact to gain one's skills through supernatural means, it's interesting to note that if work carried out in 2016 is correct, then the folktale of the blacksmith and the devil, which tells of this very thing, is probably the oldest of any folktale that we know. The main story tells how a blacksmith meets up with the devil, and ends up trapping him in some way, agreeing to release him only in return for the secrets of being an expert metal worker. Different versions vary in different ways, but the story has been traced across Russia, Scandinavia, India and America, as well as here in the UK. And of course, it's recorded by the Grimm brothers. One common motif that's found in many of the stories is the blacksmith grabbing the devil by the nose. For example, in one story, a blacksmith is approached by a woman who tries to distract him from his work. But the smith notes that the woman has cloven hooves instead of feet and so recognises that it's the devil in disguise. The smith uses his tongs to grab the devil by the nose <coughs> and removes him from the smithy. The next day, a businessman arrives and tries to offer the smith a large amount of money in a business deal. Again, the smith notices that uh, the hooves are there instead of feet. The devil never learns, or at least is never able to find shoes that fit. Once again, he grabs the devil by the nose with the tongs. But this time he doesn't let go until the devil agrees to impart the arcane knowledge which the blacksmith wants. The devil does this, but the smith also makes him promise that he will never tempt a home which has one of the blacksmith's horseshoes hanging over the door, providing us with the route for that common custom. In homes, incidentally, horseshoes tend to be hung with the points face upwards so that good luck doesn't drain out. In a smithy, they tend to be hung with the points down so that good fortune drains into the anvil. The smith, after all, has proved that he can take care of himself. There are variations in different places. So there will inevitably in the chat now be people going, oh, I hang mine upside down or I hang mine this way up or I put mine on its side or it's fine. It, it is different in different places. As with many old folk stories, <coughs> this later received a Christianized twist. And it was placed at the blacksmith's shop of St Dunstan, who was once the Archbishop of Glastonbury. And in this version, <coughs> the devil arrives asking for his horse to be shod. But Dunstan, recognising him for who he is, nails the shoes to the devil instead of to the horse, removing them only if the promise to not enter homes with a horseshoe over the door is agreed to. Notably absent now in the Christian version, as you would expect, is the supernatural deal leading to the transfer of skills. But alongside a dove, 
we still find that the blacksmith's tongs are a symbol for St Dunstan. <coughs> In medieval times, smithing was listed as one of the seven skills vital to a community. These were the skills known as the mechanical arts. A story told by a Sussex blacksmith and recorded in the journal Folklore in the 19th century runs along similar lines, but it speaks of seven trades which King Alfred compared in order to try and find the most important. And those trades were blacksmith, tailor, baker, cobbler, carpenter, butcher and stonemason. Alfred said that he would make the tradesman who could get on the best without the help of the others for the longest ruler over all the other trades. He invited representatives of the trades to a banquet, telling them to bring a specimen of their work and the tools that they used. After examining them all, the king declared that the tailor's work was the most beautiful and therefore the tailor would be king of all the trades. This angers the blacksmith and the blacksmith refuses to continue working. So obviously over time, all of the others and the king find themselves in need of repairs to tools or other work, but the blacksmith's gone. So they try and do the necessary work for themselves, but it all goes horrendously wrong. In the end, St. Clement turns up bringing the blacksmith back with him. Everyone agrees with the king that his judgment was wrong and that the blacksmith should have been the winner and everything is put right. St Clement's Day is traditionally celebrated on November the 23rd. Pope Clement I is the patron saint of metal workers and this was his feast day, also sometimes known as Old Clem's Night. In Sussex, where the story I've just told comes from, there's a house visiting tradition which is still kept up by some people known as Clemening, but it does seem to be very local to that area. Of course, if you're a blacksmith and your skills were granted by the devil, you're going to be pretty wary about him coming back and taking revenge later. So there are Smith's superstitions which prevent this from happening. When the fire is put out at the end of the day, the long handled fire tools are placed over the fire pot with their handles crossed. This apotropaic configuration is designed to keep the devil away. Another practice which is supposed to keep him at bay is to ring the anvil, that is hitting the anvil with a hammer. The folk tale behind this tells how the devil once asked a smith to fashion him with a pair of shoes after having been drawn into a forge because of hearing the anvil ringing and wondering what was going on inside. The smith, realising who the customer is, purposely makes the shoes too small and they cause the devil great pain for many days. Because of this, the devil will stay away whenever he hears an anvil ringing. Now, there is naturally a practical reason for ringing an anvil. It's the method by which the smith keeps heat in the hammer while he or she is working. We do find more female smiths now, but <coughs> traditionally it was a male occupation. And in fact, a belief originally rose that it was bad luck for a woman to enter a forge. It was also unlucky to steal from a forge unless it was the water in the slack tub, because that was said to have curative properties, but only if it was stolen and not given. There are a number of beliefs connected with blacksmiths being able to heal the sick, both here and in other countries. Blacksmiths in Kenya are looked on in the same manner as some tribes consider witch doctors, having magical powers from the spirits which can be used for healing. In Nigeria, blacksmiths are also a form of spiritual guide, but again, they're viewed as healers too. There are many traditional rituals and dances which center around the work of the smith and the whole community will turn out to observe them. In our own folklore, some blacksmiths were known as blood charmers, 
And this meant that they could cause the bleeding from an open wound to stop by passing their hands over it. <coughs> now you're all probably familiar with the magical powers said to be ascribed to a seventh child of a seventh child. And this was said to be even more effective with a seventh generation blacksmith. But the blacksmith may curse as well as cure. Many cunning folk often did this. The anvil seems to play a key part in cursing folklore and blacksmiths, as in an example from the National Folklore Collection in Ireland, which says, if you want someone to befall your neighbour, go to a blacksmith and get him to point the horn of the anvil to the east and to pronounce the curse. Elsewhere in Ireland, in another example, a landlord was found dead with blackened skin at the same time as the turning of the blacksmith's anvil took place. Now, the raw material with which the blacksmith works, iron, is considered to have magical properties, as we know, in many ways. So it's well known that fairies are on the whole repelled by iron and that witches can't cross it. Ancient Egyptians also believed that it warded off evil. These protective qualities of the element mean that it was sometimes used as a mechanism for healing as well, often in the form of a charm. As a curative, a piece of iron would sometimes be placed on the afflicted area for a period of time before being removed and then nailed to a tree. This has many similarities to a common wart charming method. Some people believed that if you bit on a piece of iron on the day before Easter, you would not suffer with toothache from the rest of the year. I would suggest if you bit too hard, you're probably more likely to suffer for toothache for the entire year, but there you go. Cramp could be kept at bay by keeping a rusty sword by the bed. Another superstition said that bringing dull iron into the house invited misfortune. So presumably it would have to be a rusty sword, which was also sharp. If you kept a hand forged nail in your coin purse, it was said that the purse would never be empty. Now that one at least is true. It would have a nail in it. When a building was being constructed, the blacksmith would ensure that the last nail was hammered in such a way that it caught the rising sun, and that would ensure good luck for the building. Nails would not be hammered traditionally on Good Friday, and that was a mark of respect in memory of the crucifixion. It's said that the nails for the crucifixion were made by a tinker, uh, that a tinker is a wandering tinsmith. So it's said that a tinker made the nails for the crucifixion because the blacksmith refused to make them. And that's why blacksmiths and forges are often considered lucky, whereas tinkers are always down on their fortunes. A piece of Irish clothing folklore says that a woman in labour would wear a smith's waistcoat in order to ensure good luck and the successful delivery of the baby. So let's move on to look at the manufacture of clothing in more detail, specifically with wool. Icy's ears will pick, prick at this point. Just this week, uh, as I was preparing for this, I remembered uh, this lovely picture, not this one, this one, which appeared on my social media a little while ago. I, I've seen it a couple of times, but it was no less impressive the last time round. For those that haven't seen it before, this is a fantastically preserved 1,700 year old sock from Egypt, which was made for a child. Uh, the item was pulled out of a landfill in Antonopolis during a 1913-1914 excavation in the area and it ended up in the British Museum collection. Non-invasive multispectral imaging determined that the sock contained seven different hues of wool woven together in a striped pattern. Three natural plant-based dyes were used to create those seven colors, 
madder roots for the red, woad leaves for the blue, and weld flowers for the yellow. Ancient Egyptians employed a single needle looping technique, which was called nalbindning, to create their socks. As you can see in this picture, the approach could be used to separate the big toe out from the four other toes in the sock. Uh, my wife pointed out to me that that put her in mind of these, which are Japanese tabby socks, which are worn with gaiter. That's footwear similar to a sandal or a flip-flop. It was probably a practical design on the part of the Japanese, and it should be considered more fashionable than modern sock and sandal wear is. Now, in pre-dynastic Egypt, Neith was the goddess of weaving. She was also known by the name knit. So therefore, it would be lovely to think that that's the etymology of knitting. But sadly, it's not. Knitting actually comes from the old English knitten, which is linked with an old Norse term, knitja, and the, German the Germanic knuten, amongst other things. And all of those terms mean the same thing. They mean to tie or to knot or to bind together. Within traditional witchcraft law and practices, knots are frequently used for the purposes of creating binding spells, and knitting might work along these lines, and glass needles are said to be especially effective for this. <coughs> the knot is believed to work as a container for the magic. Additionally, due to the repetitive nature of the act of knitting, it serves as a good method of reinforcing a spell so you recite the intention over and over with each stitch as a way of strengthening the work that you're doing. Knot magic was traditionally employed by sailors who needed to raise a wind to sail. To sail, sorry. Generally, a, a piece of rope or cord would contain three knots. Untying the first knot would release a gentle wind, uh, the second knot a strong wind, and the third knot a hurricane. The sailors themselves didn't profess to have the ability to place the required magic into the knots tied in the rope. <coughs> they would have to procure this magically imbued cord from a practitioner, somebody who sold the wind. Writing about the subject in his classic 1922 work, The Golden Bough, of which we may all be dubious about many different things, Sir James George Fraser offers examples from wizards in Finland and Lapland and witches in Shetland, Lewis and the Isle of Man. And as well as all of those northerly location, locations, witches on the southwestern peninsula of the United Kingdom were also commonly said to sell the wind. Wool would sometimes be used by witches to assist in binding and trapping something which they didn't want to be passed on, such as an ailment, for example. The Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Cornwall holds amongst its collections this wooden example of a get lost box, which was constructed for this purpose. To assist in containing the contents, the box is wound round many times with red wool. In a similar way, wishes could be captured in a wish box. Red wool and thread was a common material for banishment in magical practices. And it was used in this way in other cultural belief systems as well, uh, such as in Bulgaria, where materials were important for many ritualistic reasons. So here, both wool and cotton were considered lucky. And for this reason, they're connected to rituals which transition into something new. One example of the importance of wool in this way is at the time of marriage. In Bulgarian folklore, wool promotes fertility. The power is said to stem from its connection to the earth and, and therefore by extension to the world below that. <coughs> now in the world tree myth, wool is found within the roots. Wedding customs in Bulgaria include a ritual circle of individuals who take away the bride and one of those people is a woman who spins constantly until the bride reaches her new home. 
In other parts of Bulgaria, the bride may be given a length of wool, which should be raised three times at the door of the couple's home, or the couple should step on white wool before the marriage ceremony takes place. Clothing has always been seen as a status symbol. Knitted garments are no exception. Whilst it was once the case that knitted garments may have been the most expensive possession that someone owned and would have been continually patched or mended, this practice tended to die out. In the same way that stories and meanings within folklore change over time, attitudes to knitted items did as well. And the darning and mending practices fell out of favour because rather than the garments being seen as lavish, they became a mark of poverty. The act of spinning or knitting, which once spanned classes, became more associated with the poor and the impoverished end of the social scale. If you consider 19th century fiction, for example, you'll see these attitudes represented quite clearly. The ladies in Jane Austen's novels would embroider, but not knit. Plain work such as that was the business of the lower class by that time. The history of knitting, in fact, developed in a similar way to the spread of folklore. The practice of the art itself can be traced across Europe, for example, in the same way that the spread of certain stories and beliefs can. But also, the development of the techniques of knitting grew in ways that were symbolic of the community in which the practitioners were living. Types of stitch were developed, which represented those shapes and patterns which were observed in the natural world around the knitter. So we see stitches such as little leaf lace, traveling vine or the tree of life. That latter name also carries across to the name of a pattern style, Yggdrasil, the name of the world tree from Norse mythology. And that pattern style, Yggdrasil, is found in Scandinavian designs, uh, often as a sock pattern. And it's derived from the symbol of the mythical tree, <coughs> which is found on the Urva Hogdal tapestries. Now, these are amazingly well-preserved cloths, which date from the late Viking period, and which were discovered quite accidentally in 1909 in Överhogdal Church in Hargedal in Sweden by a 14-year-old boy who was clearing out a chest which was used for firewood. Early knitting patterns for garments weren't written down. They were passed orally from adult to child or from master to apprentice in exactly the same way that early stories or beliefs were handed down and remembered. So some patterns in coastal areas of the United Kingdom, for example, were passed on through the migration of the herring girls during the fishing season. The herring girls were ladies who traveled great distances around the coast following the fishing fleet for work. In the same way that stories and folklore eventually began to be recorded in the printed word via pamphlets or chapbooks, so the printed instructions for garments also began to become more common in the 19th century. Now that's not to say, however, that there are not written examples before that time. The oldest knitting pattern that we know to have been laid down in written form can be found in this 1655 medical book with the best name ever. Nature exanterata, or nature unbowelled for the most exquisite anatomizers of her. It's held in the welcome collection if anybody wants to go and read it. Traditional styles of knitting are less likely to have been lost in very rural or isolated communities simply because there would have been less influence from outsiders. It was a craft which would have been the main source of income for many. <clears throat> and for this reason, it was common for people to knit whilst they were undertaking other tasks. And aids were created to assist with this, such as a wooden sheath, which was wound around the waist and which supported the wool. You can still find versions of this now. A Yorkshire woman called Slinger 
would walk to the local market around three miles away, carrying all of the garments her family had knitted to sell that week in a bag on her head, and she would continue her own knitting while she walked. Ever since the Industrial Revolution led to cheaper mass-produced garments, the demand for hand-knitted items has still remained strong. Part of their appeal, quality aside, is the more individualistic nature. Knitters are more able to respond to trends or changes in taste, and they'd often create designs which were informed by cultural legends or stories. There was an intrinsic link between knitting and storytelling when people came together in groups to do it. And that was evidenced in 1837 when William Howitt wrote, at Garsdale, the old men sit in companies round the fire and because they get so intent on knitting and telling stories, they pin cloths on their shins to prevent themselves from getting burnt. To finish off the examination of this topic, we'll, we'll come up to date and turn to the developing field of urban folklore. Now, as the boundaries between rural life and city life become increasingly blurred in the modern world, we find more and more practices and beliefs, which were certainly at one time seen as the domain of the country dweller, being absorbed and acted out in the urban landscape. Now, wool has also made its way into the urban sprawl in the 21st century in the form of what we now sometimes term yarn bombing, that is the act of covering or decorating parts of the landscape around us with woolen artefacts. In an article in the Daily Telegraph newspaper in January of 2009, guerrilla knitting, as it was originally termed, was noted as being initially almost exclusively about reclaiming and personalizing sterile and cold public places. Now, the exact origins of the idea are not 100% certain, and that's often the case even with newer folklore as we know. There are certainly examples recorded as early as May 2004 in Dan Helder in the Netherlands, and in 2005, knitters in Texas, in the United States, utilised their leftover or unfinished knitting projects for this purpose. The start of the movement is often attributed to this lady, a resident from Houston called Magda Sayeg. She says that she first had the idea in 2005 when she covered the door handle of her boutique with a custom-made woolen door handle cozy. However, earlier than this, in 2002, there was an artist called Sharon Sholian who knitted tree stump cozies for felled trees in Oregon. Whatever the origin is, the movement progressed over time and it innovated with the creation of the stitched story. Now, that concept is generally attributed to Lauren O'Farrell from London, who founded a graffiti knitting collective called Knit the City. Their first installation was in August of 2009 uh, with a piece of art called Web of Woe. Now, Lauren didn't like the kind of more violent connotations of the term yarn bombing from the original American examples. And she used a slightly tamer version of the term, uh, which she called yarn storming to describe the group's activities. The Knit the City Collective maintained a sense of humour about the whole thing and especially about the group's origins. So whenever they were interviewed, the six original members would tell a different story about how the group came about. <coughs> and to further add to the air of mystery, they didn't use their own names. They all used superhero style street names for themselves. So most people know Lauren O'Farrell, for example, as Deadly Knit Shade, which was her street name. Uh, others were the Knitting Ninja and the Purple Pearl, for example. In late August of 2009, 
Knit the City became the first collective to publicise a live yarn storming on Twitter. And some people might remember this, it involved the six churches of the orange, Oranges and Lemons nursery rhyme. It was called Oranges and Lemons Odyssey. And images of the six hour installation were published on Twitter feed in real time. Now, from small beginnings with a cosy for a wooden barrier in Covent Garden and afterwards, probably what is still their most well known piece, the phone box cosy in Parliament Square. <coughs> the group have since shown work at the Tate Britain and they've had commissions from large knitwear companies and from other groups such as the Nintendo Corporation. Knit the City would add paper or fabric tags onto their pieces of work, carrying their logo and their website address, along with the phrase, confess your theft. And members of the public were encouraged to take the items away and to then report back as to where they were or to photograph them elsewhere in the landscape. We can take much from this example away if we look at the dissemination of similar pieces of folklore in the landscape today, yarn stormings become quite common. Recently, we've begun to see a proliferation of painted stones in the landscape, again, often bearing Twitter hashtags so that people can re-photograph them elsewhere and post them again. The whole idea stems from the hobby of geocaching, really, amongst other things. And all of that comes from original ideas such as the anonymous leaving of offerings on wayside graves or other markers or love locks or other contemporary assemblages. What it does to wrap all of this up is to go a long way to demonstrate how the beliefs and the ideas of our ancestors continue to proliferate through our modern lives in many and various ways. And which, as I've said in many other places before, demonstrate why rather than being a subject to be sidelined or to be demeaned, folklore is a subject which should hold an ongoing fascination for everybody. If you are indeed fascinated, then there are contact details for my podcast or email or Twitter, which um, I know have been posted elsewhere as well. Um, and also, if you are interested in our work in collecting and preserving folklore, then you can also visit the Folklore Library and Archive on that address right there. Sam, I will pass it back to you.